Okay. okay, so we are singing. Yeah. It's not angels from the realms of glory, but it's that tune. That tune. It's lo, he comes with clouds descending. So we have everybody. Matthew, I'm sorry, I don't have any notes for you. Do you want a hymnal? Do you want a hymnal to see notes? It's fine. No, I've got one upstairs. Pretend that I know. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't have numbers in it, though. <laughs> There's no base so numbers. Right? If I can't read the notes and read the words in two different places. How <laughs> loud enough? simple understanding that has come our way, help us to be responsible, users of that enormous truth that eludes so many millions of people. We praise you, we glorify you as the great creator, sustainer of all life, giving us every breath of air that we breathe, every bite of food that we'll be eating. We're praying now for our friends out there in the miraculous world of internet, that each one will be blessed by what they hear, what they contribute to the discussion this morning as we tackle the 13th chapter of Romans and the 14th chapter of Acts as well. We ask you for intelligence and wisdom and the spirit of Jesus to be with us, the spirit and the mind of Christ to be with us. As we track with the words of Paul, we can make sense of them. We can have a decent discussion and interaction with them. We're praying for the upcoming conference next week again, asking you to bless every step of every path that each of those participants makes as they make their way to Atlanta. For every speech that's given, that every talk that's given, every faith story, every song that's sung, every testimony, that all would be done to your glory, that we can glorify you and show the world what the one church should be like, believing in you as the only one who is true God and in your Son and Messiah. We put this time now into your hands, asking to bless us all in Messiah's name. Amen. 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 Okay, you can see So it's great that some of you are out there listening. See, presumably, this magic camera seems to work quite well. So tell your friends to join us if they don't have any, anywhere else to go on Sunday morning. And join us for the effort we make to uh, expand the Book of Romans as it is now, moving to another book. In fact, you might want to suggest where else you think we might go in Scripture when we get to the end of Romans. We're rapidly getting there. Mark. Did we say? Yes, we did. Mark. Sarah's uh, reminding me on my left here, Sarah, and my daughter and secretary, Sarah. Mark, I think, would be excellent. We need all to go back to the Synoptic Gospel, and Mark would be a wonderful one to play. So we'll found a Mark in the next few weeks, God willing. And so, um, <laughs> usual subjects out there. But I was going to read a rather interesting letter from Adelaide. It's a little bit long, but I think you might find it interesting. So I think we should start with that. This is a, a fellow who is a songwriter by profession, and he's been studying his Bible over the years. Adelaide, that's in what? Part of Australia, so yeah. So, uh, so you can be, yeah. 
This is an Adelaide, and you, you sense the good sense, the intelligence, the wisdom of this gentleman who's coming through the fog of Trinity and other things to the truth. This is long, but very exciting. <laughs> Bear with me, please. Uh, dear Anthony, I joined the Restoration Fellowship Facebook page some time ago and feel that it's now time to properly introduce myself. I am from Adelaide, South Australia, married with three children and gifted in the area of music and songwriting. Like the vast majority of Christians, I grew up in a church that preached the doctrine of the Trinity, and although my understanding of the details was fuzzy, I never questioned the validity of this teaching. Yet my hunger for the completeness of God's truth remained, and guided by His Spirit, about three years ago, I embarked upon a period of intense study and reflection, at the end of which I finally rejected the doctrine of the Trinity and recognized the truth that God is one personality only, the Father, and that Jesus is His human Son, endowed with God's own power. He is the Messiah elevated in the Father's right hand, but is not God Himself. In this journey, your teaching material, web articles, focus on the kingdom, newsletters, etc., has been invaluable. By the time I got my hands on a physical copy of your book, Jesus Was Not a Trinitarian, I was pretty much already convinced of the truth, and reading the book itself was the icing on the cake. I underlined large portions of the text and refer back to it often. My search for truth and the considerably large step of rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity was undertaken in complete isolation, for example, without any allies on this journey whatsoever. Not only are the majority of churches in my city denominationally traditional and piously conservative, there is also a strong pro-Trinity teaching ministry based here. At best, my new position is considered erroneous by all and dangerously heretical by many. Out of a need for fellowship, my family and I attend a conservative evangelical Baptist church, but I dare not speak of my rejection of Trinitarian theology. Through various internet wanderings, I have connected with the Redwoods Church in Melbourne uh, and their pastor, Steve Casares. But Melbourne is 850 kilometers distant from Adelaide, and as yet I haven't met anyone here who shares my new convictions. The other arm of your teaching that has been a great benefit to me is the clear and straightforward way in which you speak about God's kingdom. Satan has thrown a vast deception over the minds of average Christians regarding the kingdom of God, and I was no different. I wrestled for many years about what exactly the kingdom was, and like many, my answer was muddled by the claim that the kingdom arrived with Jesus' first appearing, and so is here now. Your insistence that the gospel preached by Jesus in the early church was the message of a coming future political reality upon a renewed earth governed by Messiah and his saints mm -hmm. was like a beacon to my soul, mm -hmm. and it stripped away my confusion and fruitless wrestling with the apocalyptic scriptures. Not only that, but it helped to uh, re reset my understanding of the Christian faith as a life pilgrimage, a journey of hope towards a city that is currently only seen by faith. A recent experience with my current church family serves to highlight just how serious the confusion about God's kingdom is for the average Christian. In a group discussion setting, the church was asked to define the kingdom of God. Answers ranged from wherever, wherever God is working, that is the kingdom, to the mystical, the kingdom is inside us all to the downright concerning, God is the king of the whole earth. Therefore, the whole earth, in its present state, is the kingdom of God. Everyone is already in the kingdom. Some just don't know it yet. So confusing. <laughs> of even greater concern is the acceleration in charismatic churches towards a complete uh, post-millennial mindset. The power-hungry elite in these circles covet control of the so-called seven mountains of society and believe that it is their role to create God's kingdom on earth, mm -hmm. only after which Jesus returns in something of an afterthought. Yes. <laughs> they talk much about the kingdom, but sadly promote a false kingdom of their own creation that is only playing right into the hands of Satan and his future global empire of the Antichrist. I believe that as the time draws nearer, 
to, to Christ's return the difference between the gospel of the kingdom preached by Jesus and an orthodox Nicene mindset will become greater, more, more viable, I'm sorry, more visible and more pronounced. I believe that in time I will begin and lead a fellowship here that is committed to these truths in the hope that I might preserve some, some believers from the great deceptions deception, sorry, that is coming and has already come. I strongly believe in the Lord's promise to preserve for himself a remnant of true believers. However, I'm waiting for the Lord's timing and his release before I do so, and think that at the moment the pressure of being alone might be too great for my young family. But I'm certainly committed to preserving and promoting these great truths of God, his Messiah, and the coming kingdom within my songwriting and whatever other avenues present themselves. Anthony, may Messiah bless your ongoing search, uh, ongoing work for the kingdom. I will remain in touch and keep you updated on any developments here in Adelaide. Yeah. Maranatha, our Lord come, her may. Now remember that because that's what Jesus had said, Maranatha. Well, early church is in Maranatha. It's good. What was his name? Well, we'll keep his name. Yeah, Australia. Yeah. Australia. Australia. Listening, he's, not, Australia. he's not tuning in, right? Because it's probably no, no, nighttime. No, it's probably yeah. Nighttime. Yeah. 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 That's great. The interesting thing is that we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. This, his study began three years ago. Yeah. 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 We didn't, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating to think mm -hmm. that he's been intensely studying for over three years. Wow. And now he's been. He's been certainly been not hearing that in church. No, not hearing in church, right. <laughs> First millennial point. I hope you didn't miss that. The charismatic movement is saying, we are going to take over the king of the world now. Yeah, we're supposed to be building yeah, the kingdom. Yeah, building, building. Take leader. Let's work millennium. toward building the kingdom. And I thought, really? That's and not then as an afterthought, he said, Jesus will come back post-millennium, at the end of our thousand years, and we produce peace on the earth. But the charismatics are the dangerous ones. Watch out. They're the dangerous ones there. They've got all this power, and they're going to create the kingdom. That's amazing. Stephen Carroll say uh, it's very touching, and I see ourselves in it. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, many of us can see ourselves. That's right. Well, we see all of us see ourselves there. We've all come out of chaos, hopefully, into greater life. So, the point of reading these letters is to encourage others to feel, yeah, that's my journey, you know, you can identify with that. That's the point of it. Okay, very good. Any other comments you want to write? You know, keep, keep uh, posting them here to Michelle. And we'll deal with it. 13th chapter of Romans. This, I don't want to spend too long on this. It's a short chapter. We talked extensively about our relationship to the state. I don't, we don't want to hammer that again. Let's move on with the very self-evident truths here, which are highly relevant, may I say, to some that we're corresponding with. On no account should you not pay taxes. On no account should you not do what the government requires you to do. To do so is to shake your fist at Jesus and God. So we're not going to do that. And Paul is about to say that kind of thing. So I'll start with 13.1. Ask Tara on my left here uh, to do two, if you would, and so on around the room, as you feel you'd like to read from whatever translation. Go do the back row first. And then back row first, minutes. and then maybe around here. Mm -hmm. right. 13.1 in the New American Standard Update version said, Every person is to be in subjection to the government authorities. For well, there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For the authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be in fear, for it does not bear the sword in vain. It is God's servant to administer retribution on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for concerns, say, consciousness. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom taxes do, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You know, this is pause there. I, it's marvelous stuff. Something brand new struck me when I read this this time uh, in terms of obedience. 
it struck me that what he says here about obedience to authority would apply equally well to obedience to Christ. You see, that's it's a very clear idea in the New Testament. Strong sense of structure. You do what the boss says. In this case, the context is the boss, the government. But you can apply that to Jesus as our boss. As our boss. Exactly the same thing. I was thinking of those verses in John, where the wrath of God is, is resting on you if you don't obey Jesus. If you don't submit to the ultimate authority of Jesus, then the same principles would apply as applied to disobedience to the government. Obviously, Jesus is not the government now. We see that. The government is very imperfect. He's talking about a rather benign government here. You know, it's still kind and good to people. But the principle is very clear that you either do what the boss says or you don't. It's very easy. Isn't it? I see that model in the family too, right? Dad says you do it. You do it. For your own good. Mom says you do it, you do it. This is very easy, but we've lost the sense of hierarchy to a large extent. So every person, I love that, psihi in Greek, psihi, soul, every soul. That's right. The word soul in the Bible is not an immortal soul that goes on living after you die. It means a person. And your animals are persons also. They're also living creatures, nefesh, hayi. You'll find them in Genesis, all introduced along with human beings as living creatures. And this is the beautiful word for person. Correctly translated in the New American Standard Version, probably the King James has every soul. The meaning is every person is to be subject in subjection to the governing authorities. I, I get it. There's no authority except from God. So God has allowed all sorts of different governments. Some of them are very cruel, I see that. Some are very benign. In America, we are tremendously free compared with other kinds. I understand all that. But the principle is clear if the policeman says stop, you stop. This isn't difficult, is it? Let's not shake our fist at the government. Let's not not pay taxes. And we run into all the time. Oh, I'm not paying my taxes. Let's keep the government. They might misuse it. Don't do that. Oh, I'm not going to submit to the people who search me at the airport because they, they might do something improper to me. Forget it. Relax. Be normal. We've got some wacko people on the line out there in, in email land. But don't be such an individualist that you're just wacko. You know, that you've got your special thing that nobody else does. No need to be quite that out on a limb. Man. Whoever resists authority, and I'm thinking, if you resist Jesus, same problem as that, has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation. You're simply under condemnation. John 3.36 should be preached about four times every Sunday. He who obeys the Son is doing good. He who doesn't believe in the Son is in great trouble. The only issue in the New Testament is who you're going to obey, that's Hebrews 5 9. I recommend that text all the time. Hebrews 5 9. Salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. End of story. Let's argue about it. Hebrews 5 9, John 3 36. I hammer away on those texts in our classes in the college. And to me, they're very simple, illuminating verses. Then, rulers, he says in verse 3, are not a cause of fear for good behavior, right? We keep the speed limit. Nothing to worry about. You go rushing through the light at 90 miles an hour. You have every reason to fear and get punished. Actually, a huge blessing, isn't it? I mean, look at the blessing of authority. Thank God there is an authority that stops me from driving 90 miles an hour. That's marvelous. That's a huge blessing. Thank goodness that I'm looking at a father here in the family, that those little ones have this father to say, don't do that, you're going to kill yourself. Right? Do it my way, and you will learn that that's the best way to do it. Thank goodness there is a law that says that sex belongs only within marriage. Because if that doesn't happen, then you've got the chaos of children without parents and divorce suits and all of that nonsense that people go through, all of which can be forgiven. I understand that. But it's a simple abuse, isn't it? It, it really isn't brain breaking stuff. He then says in 4 the state is a minister of God. Yes, it's God's servant. It doesn't mean the state is the church. You understand? He's not trying to say. The state is all Christian. That's not the point. But the state has some balancing, controlling effect on us all for our good. This is the point. But if you do what's evil, you better be scared. Same thing with Jesus. You want to go on breaking the laws of Jesus? Watch out. It doesn't bear the sword in vain. Now, this is a key, key phrase. The state is the one that bears the sword. The problem with Luther was that he tried to wear two hats. He said, as a Christian, you basically don't have the sword, but as a member of the state, you do. Wearing two hats is very complicated. Better, I think, to let the state get on and do what the state is going to do with its avenging stuff. Because just in the previous chapter, you know Paul had said, you don't do avenging, you don't do the vengeance. 
You stay away from the vengeance. Let the state do whatever avenging the state is going to do. I see that. It's, it's a hard doctrine, but I think rather clear. What's Luther and Calvin? Luther and Calvin, same thing. They, they didn't quite get that sort of done. Then, if you practice evil, then wrath. That reminded me immediately of John 3, 36. I'll go on repeating it. He who obeys Jesus is doing well. He who doesn't believe in Jesus is doing badly. Black and white. Therefore, in five, it's necessary to be in subjection. Right, we better honor. I'm not even keen on this abomination of desolation. Let's not slur the name of the president. You may have every right to disagree with some of his That's fine. But he's in charge of us at some level. He is the elected president. He's God's minister to us in this text. Let's treat all men with respect, especially people in authorities like that. It's poor policy, I think, he, sloppy to, 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 to fool with his name. When you say he, you're talking he, the, the, the state, the ruler? The state. Obama. Obama. In this, in this I missed that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Obama, yeah, yeah. And we should respect him. Do I miss that? that the, the, the use of his name in a sloppy way, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate. Like, we refer sometimes to our friends in, in sloppy ways. Give them the honor of treating them with a real name and don't slop around with it. It's a kind of an implied, well, I'm better than you are, and I'm guilty of this too, I'm sure. Let's treat every human being as a valid person. It's, a, it's just a good way to be, isn't it? You keep saying this is simple. Yes. <laughs> I wish I wish it worked. Simple um, in principle, yes. But let me, yeah. but let me just uh, yeah. comment here that, so, so if we, if we uh, accept uh, the way we're reading this, that God ordains, God sets, God puts all governments, good or bad. Yeah. So that that's you know it's 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 simple, I guess, teaching, but accepting an evil government and and, and knowing that God is allowing this, but it's, it it goes beyond allow, allowing it. It goes to God puts them there. God ordains them. There. So, with that said, how do you answer the fact that God raised up people to overthrow governments at times? So, isn't that sort of a contradictory in a way? I don't think so. The problem here is to think like a Hebrew. If God ordains something, it's the same as saying He permits it. It's the same idea. God is the ultimate authority behind it. He may really regret some of those governments. I'm sure He does. But it's, we don't think that way in the West, but they do in Hebrew mind. What God allows, he has determined. That's fine. And if he gets fed up with the government, at any point he can take it away. He can do all that. I can't explain in every case how that works. All I know is that here in America we're enjoying enormous freedoms, and we should respect the authorities and give them the honor that's due to them according to this passage. Just saying. And, and I'm thinking, wouldn't it actually be more accurate uh, instead of talking about, we shouldn't slander or dishonor anybody. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But in the case of our Obama, mm -hmm. um, we should respect the office of course. because that whoever yeah. holds that office changes yeah. every few years. Good point. And we don't, it's, we, uh, many of us don't agree with Mr. Obama. So I, I'm going to speak because it's my right to America, and I'm going to speak my disagreement. And I do get. Mm, rather mm, colorful <laughs> in my disagreements, my descriptions of my disagreements. One of my sister in law yeah. just about unfriended me on Facebook yeah. because she didn't like the way I was disrespecting the man holding the office of president. Yeah. But it's, it's I guess say the authority in this case is not the hereditary rulers of like they were in other countries. Yeah. This is the office, right. and because different people. Okay. Right. Exactly right. In England, they're now debating the issue of gay marriage very fervently. And uh, an impassioned Christian friend of mine, Bible friend of mine, is lobbying as hard as he can to get the House of Commons not to approve gay marriage. And he then remarked that the House of Lords, I don't know if you've written, we have the aristocracy so called, the inherited title, Lord so and so, Lord so and so, Lord so and so. They have the House of Lords as a separate part of the governmental system. They're very unlikely to pass that. For some reason, at the level of aristocracy, they're still against gay marriage. Oh, at the level of the major part of the government, it could go either way. All of that's fair dialogue, I see that. So it's clear. So the, the, God, so the state, the government will mm -hmm. do what they do, yes. and we must do what works for the Absolutely. And, and like, 
Um, Jerry said, Jerry said something very key. Yeah. We must seek to honor and respect the honors. every person, regardless of That's their right. position in society. That's right. And yeah. it's hard. And I agree with you. Jerry played very well. We respect the office. Whoever holds the office. And clearly, in the case of Hitler, the church made a huge mistake by not objecting. The church in Germany, as is well known, and the Roman Catholic Church, too, went along with Hitler. That was pathetic, and only von Hitler and a few others objected to Hitler. I think it's a slightly different story. Anyway, enough of that, a lot of history there. He actually got to kill von Hitler because he went against Hitler, which was the, the state at the time. And he wound up then breaking his own principle by trying to kill Hitler. So it's a messy story, but it's history is good. Anyway, it's good. You're all good citizens. I don't think we're you know, trying to uh, you know, correct anybody very strongly. You know, the, the, there are notable uh, yeah. preachers out there, ev yeah. evangelicals, yeah. that are saying pretty much the same thing we're saying. Uh, I heard someone very, uh, John MacArthur, mm -hmm. to throw a name, mm -hmm. yes. who said, uh, what was it? He said a very well put sentence Jesus was not a. a a social worker, something like that. Like oh, he wasn't not a social. Worker. Yeah, social he man. wasn't a social act. He didn't come to change communities socially active in this and that. No, no, he came about what we know. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are people out there. This isn't some cold no. <laughs> sort of no, no, idea. Absolutely. Let's read on for the sake of getting to the yeah. um, Ramon sure. says, "I love how Anthony teaches this." There are too many people out there in TV land that preach and teach against the government yes. to the point of insulting. Yes. And it's not very clear. That's right. I think that's exactly right. And, um, yes, to the point of insulting is a good line. Says, it's not too bad. I think it's Rick. I'm sorry, I keep yeah. using that. I think mm -hmm. it's Rick. Mm -hmm. um, says, Paul was an example when he addressed Roman rulers when in change, yeah. such as calling Festus most noble. Yes. Festus. Good point. Mm -hmm. Paul also used his state rights, he used his citizenship, and I would too. Someone's going to do me harm in Malawi, I'm going to appeal to the British government there to help me out, uh, you know, the consulate. Paul used that. He used his Roman citizenship very cleverly to get himself extricated from a mess. So, yes, I'll do that. I'll use the police in our home here. If somebody's burgling our house at this moment, God forbid, the police will be there in five minutes. It's amazing. When they had a fire in the house next to our house, we had five or six fire trucks, police cars, in 30 seconds. That's a huge blessing. I'm in favor of that. And, and I admire the courage of those people, the skills of all, of the, all of those people. I just don't think they quite understand that Jesus came to do strictly the immortality plan. What Jesus is doing is saying, look, Adam failed. Adam is going to succeed. Man is to rule the world. I, Messiah, am going to rule the world. Who would like to rule the world with me? Are you on board or not? That's it. It's a very simple message. It has to be delivered to ordinary foes. Not complicated. Adam failed, second Adam succeeded. That's what Jesus is doing, bringing immortality to life through the gospel, 2 Timothy 1.10. Preached again five or six times every Sunday, 2 Timothy 1.10. Jesus revealed the way to living forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You're interested in that? Jesus is your man. The trouble is with me, such a mess in his teaching, it's very hard to see what he taught in regards to immortality. So, let's go on then. Eight. Who's eight? This is Tom Cox reading now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Love does no wrong to anyone, so love satisfies all of God's requirements. Do this, knowing, verse 11, that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. The deeds, sorry, the wrong. And for now, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. Night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity <laughs> and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to arouse your desires. Yeah. 
This is a tall order stuff. And every, every chapter we read, this is a tall order. I understand some principles. We get this right in our lives. It's very true. Simple. 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 And yet, very hard to get everybody to do all of this stuff. But some of these verses are just, they just make my spine tingle in reading them. Look at this 11. Salvation is now nearer to us than when we first believed. That's the exact opposite of what you get in evangelical tracts. It's all, when I got saved, and nothing I do now is going to alter. When I got saved, I was saved when I was sick. Well, you know, I, maybe. When I got saved, when I got, when, salvation is now closer to me as I run the race towards salvation. Why doesn't the evangelical world change its scheme entirely and go in reverse and get these sort of texts out of this? Salvation is mainly in the future. You're being saved, but you aren't saved fully yet. You're working towards it. And I'm very struck when I read this. He tells the church to wake up, doesn't he? He's addressing the church here. Come out of the couch, stop slumbering, and do something. Right? Paul is saying that to the church here. I don't know how that applies to us individually, but it's rather striking. Or Salvation is near to us among the first people. And then Paul says somewhere else, or else Jesus will catch you like a, a thief in the night. You're not so wake up. Right, so wake up. Do not be on. like the world. Exactly. It's not that Jesus is going to come tonight. Right. That's true. So certain things have to happen, but we should be on the alert, watching. That's right. The night is almost gone. This present evil age, Galatians 1 4, the P E A, the present evil society in which we're living right up to the second coming. The present evil generation, nothing to do with 40 years, 70 years, 100 years. This evil brood, this society organized against God, basically, right up to the second coming, is nearly over, and the dawn is coming. Isn't that what the dawn? The light of Messiah arriving to say, folks, let's do this differently. Let's have marriage between a man and a woman. Let's have solid families. Let's get everything right. Can you imagine what the world would be like? I'm going to show them at the conference upcoming, Isaiah 7, 14, which says, the whole world is at rest. They break forth into singing. Can you imagine that day? That's a marvelous millennial picture. Isaiah 7, 14. The whole earth is at rest. This is a huge sigh of relief. When the Antichrist is gone, huge depopulation of the world. Let me pause on that thought. Isaiah 24, verse 6 says, God is going to, or 24th chapter of Isaiah says, there's going to be a huge depopulation of the world. And then in 24, 6, it says, few human beings are left. That got my attention this week. Especially because the Seventh day Adventists, all 23 million of them, not more or less intelligent than you, say there'll be nobody left. Who wants a ministry to help those dear Seventh day Adventist friends to correct that little point? You can go to Ellen G. White's great controversy book, Forgotten the Page, you'll see she does a trick there. In her book, it says, what the Bible says there in Isaiah 24, God is going to shake the world like you wouldn't believe. And then she comes to the little phrase about, and few people are left. And she stops. She doesn't do that. She puts a period and the end quote. Oh, goodness. Oh, yes. I want you to know that the Bible is a crime scene. If you're not watching, if you're not watching what's going on, you're going to be sucked into all of that. People are. That's an obvious thing. All right. Who's out there ready to get a ministry on that one point? Go on the XS Seventh day Adventist blogs and go for it. Point out that Ellen G. White simply deceived the people. She left out no, uh, sorry, very few people are being left. Isaiah 24, 6. Check 15, 30, 40, 50 translations in five languages. There's no difficulty about it at all. And that's an interesting point because <coughs> if you agree with Ellen White that only Satan is left alive for a thousand years, you've done away with the millennium. A considerable slap in God's face, isn't it? This is the lady that had a vision of the Sabbath and got all these people keeping the weekly Sabbath, although Paul said the Sabbath's a shadow, superseded by the Messiah who has come. So a lot of work, a lot of ministry dealing with them. You could deal with that or anything else one chooses to do. Okay, I had to get off on that because this is what we've been dealt with this week. Then we're in the rest of Romans uh, 13 here. Wait, a couple of comments. Please, please comment. Absolutely. Um, Cursed devour, this is from Carlos over here. Cursed devours the earth, and those who live in it are 
held guilty. Yes. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and a few men are left. Isaiah 24 6. Isn't that great? The remnant. Um, How few is few? First John says, I am a former Seventh day Adventist. Which Ellen G. White book are you speaking of? The Great Controversy. That's the name of the book? Absolutely. Okay. Famous book. I can't give you the page. Sounds controversial to me. It's, it's very funny. Uh, right about page 479, have a good look at what she did there. Treacherous. You can't stop a sentence in the middle and put a period and an end quote. She simply left out and few people are left. Now here's an example of how people will struggle to maintain an evident problem. Uh, so somebody writes to me last week and said, well, wait a minute, if you look at some of the paraphrased versions like the CEV, contemporary English version, or the, the promise, you'll find it simply says that men and women are dwindling away. Now, if you look at 50 other translations in 14 languages, or whatever, how many languages you can deal with, let's say five, six, seven, there's no doubt about it at all. It says, and few people are left. But because that interfered with the guru's idea, you see, this is our tendency. We will, we will claim for dear life to a self-evident error if it interferes with our system. It's applying this to ourselves. But I thought that was a classic example. Nothing against the Seventh-day Adventists, wonderful people and so on. But come on, folks, let's read Isaiah 24, 6 and actually believe what it says. Because Ellen G. White just did away with the man and put Satan alone. That's ruling the world for a thousand years. Wow. Okay, that was the comment that was being made. Ah, uh, yes. And then um, yeah. their railing might get them killed one day if this nation ever becomes a dictatorship. But to us yeah. will appear, to us, probably it will appear faultless among a crooked and perverse generation. Is that an exact description? Yeah. Um, and then Stephen Kara said, curious, instead of saying, I was saved in 1998, yeah. should we say, I believed on Jesus in 1998? Yeah, uh, that's or, I accepted Jesus as, as Messiah. It's wonderful, I'm, I'm just to, with the big smile on my face, please don't say, I believed on anything, because it's fog language, it's King James. Nobody believes on anything. So, I believed in Jesus, I believed the gospel, whatever, certain date, and I accepted Messiah as my Savior, whatever. But not, I got saved finally, and there's nothing I could do now to spoil it. I began the journey of salvation with the United States. Dan, Dan says, we were saved, are being saved, right. and will be saved. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Charismatic twirls all round. <laughs> That's dead right. 100% right. The, the other disturbing thing I, I have encountered is former whatevers. Yes. Former Catholic. previous yeah. former yeah. saying, I was saved yeah. in that church. Yeah, I know it for sure, even though I have come out sure. of those churches. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. At least it needs to be thought about. You were saved in some sense. And in our own experience with Armstrong, was I saved when I joined Armstrong? It was an awful experience, mm -hmm. but I agree that's a personal thing. You all have to assess. Exactly how God works with you. Well, have you really been born again? I would ask. We didn't believe in being born again. You keep saying that. I mean, have you really come then? To, if you keep saying to me, no, I was, I know I was, well, uh, I was saved in the Catholic Church, although I'm not in there, or the one Church. What? It's, it's at least open to examination. Anyway, this is fine. Whatever okay. question. Um, and Stephen Kerr said, yes, but I thought Anthony just said evangel evangelicals shouldn't say I was saved. Uh, well, we can certainly say I was saved. They think you mean as it completed or finished that. That's exactly right. I mean, you say I, I began the race when the gun went off and I'm not running the race. And Dan Shaw put it perfectly. It's salvation in three tenses of the verb. I was saved. I'm being served. Saved. Sorry. So saved. And I'm going to be saved in the future, which is the major one. You want statistically, Paul mostly looks at salvation. Yet in the future. So well, we'll about that. I want to just make an umbrella statement and say, I am saved. Yes. Well, I'm well, saying that it tends to explain that. That's, that's what we're saved, always saved. Yes. Yes. What we're working against is no sass. It isn't, it's not once saved, always saved. That's what we're working against. It's an ongoing process. You have to yeah. keep your nose to the ground and so on. Jesus said, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Perfect. Wonderful. And so there's some enduring and growing and repenting and constant. Most strongly of all, Paul says in Romans 13, I think it is, if you Christians do not remain in the faith, you will be cut off. Well, yeah. that doesn't get a lot of press, nor does Luke 8, 13, where Jesus said some believe for a while, some believe for a while, they believe for a while. They didn't, they weren't kidding. 
They believed for a while, and then life crowded in on them, and they gave up. They didn't make it. Anyway, it was it's an easy time. Okay. And then Dan okay. says, yes. "Por qué hablamos en español?" And then Carlos says, "Vasquez es hispano." <laughs> and then Don says, "I'll see," which is translated, <laughs> "Why are you speaking in Spanish?" <laughs> are you going to read that? Or not? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I just, just. Isn't that Dan Shaw? Is that Dan Shaw who's the Dan, linguist? In Dan asks why you speak. Well, he's yeah. he's speaking to Ramon in Spanish. Uh, talking about Catherine getting on to Facebook. Sorry, I just had to throw in a little right. humor. <laughs> I guess. I actually, I actually could read it, so. You don't think you can speak in Spanish and I won't know what you're saying. So. That's great. I love it. Before you leave this topic, could you speak to uh, the term accepting Jesus? Because is it not more biblical to say that Jesus accepts us? Yes, that's a good point. This phrase, accepting Jesus, is awfully vague. What did you really accept? Better, as the Bible says, God accepted you. When you repent, in the biblical terms, I know that sometimes that may be over a period of time, you don't come to all this truth in one day, that's true, but God accepted us. That's a biblical phrase. Asking Jesus into your heart easily dissolves into a very mystical and unclear thing. It's not quite precise. Jesus doesn't say, repent and ask me into your heart. They misuse the text in Revelation which says, I'm knocking on the door. Open your heart and accept it. That's not right. I'm knocking on the door to come and eat with you, is the sense there. Not into your heart. I want to come in your house and have a meal with you, is the sense. So those texts have been abused. He's speaking to Christians. There. And he's speaking to Christians, Sarah's point. He's not talking to the unconverted world. Open your heart and accept me. He's talking to the Christian church there. So it's the abuse of these texts that's so disappointing because it's created the great model that I think we're in. Is that similar far far to... What scripture says it's not that we love him, he loved us first. Right. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Somehow we're drawn, attracted to Christ through the gospel, and then we we do have a choice though to accept it or refuse it. And the text there is Acts 13, 47, where Paul said to the people who didn't believe what he said, You are judging yourself unworthy of eternal life. Key text could be used three or four times a Sunday. Acts 13, 47 or 46 there. Paul says, wait a minute, before you leave, you're not accepting what he, the apostle, is saying. You, therefore, are making your own decision. You're killing yourself. You're judging against yourself. You're counting yourself unworthy of the life of the age to come in the kingdom. I like the simplicity of that. Does that mean that you can earn your salvation? Of course not. But you can refuse to accept it. It's a cooperative effort. Synergism is the word of theology. S-Y-N-E-R-G-I-S-M. You've got to work together with God. In some sense, it's a cooperative effort. Otherwise, you're robots. You have no power of decision. And the whole Bible is... It's okay. Moving on. Anything else? Um, Paul beat himself into subjection Good lest point. after he preached the word, yes. he should be disqualified. Powerful text. You don't hear that preached very much. Paul is watching himself very carefully. Lest he would be a castaway, even for. Do you know what scripture that is? Or Ramon, do you know what scripture that is? Um, that one would be in Corinthians. Corinthians, Corinthians, Corinthians. Second Corinthians. I'm not sure that. I beat my body. Yep. Yep. We'll get it. And that would be after he accepted. Uh, First Corinthians nine twenty seven. Nine twenty seven. Great. First Corinthians nine twenty seven. Putting it all together, I think it's very clear. You're running a race, so it ain't over till it's over. All right, moving on. Let's move to the next little section. 13 says, uh, behave properly as in the day, not in carousing. Heaven forbid, I hope none of us in this crowd carousing. Can you imagine how stupid that would be in view of what we know? Not in drunkenness, heaven forbid, but I will put in my plug for legitimate use of wine. You'll find that God commanded them to have wine and strong drink at festivals. You'll find that in Deuteronomy. He actually commanded them to be normal, rejoice, don't get drunk. But this obsession that, again, with the Seventh-day Adventists, there are whole books to try to condemn the use of alcohol. The problem with that is that you're condemning Jesus. Had you been at that wedding then, seen 120 gallons of water turned into wine, you would have been <coughs> condemning Jesus. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be more righteous than Jesus. So allow the Bible to speak. Yes, you can have your glass of wine and rejoice. No, you'd better not be drunk. All this is clear in Europe, but not clear in America because of the so-called temperance movement, which actually was a lying title. It was a prohibition movement, 
We all believe in temperance, but if you're going to be into the prohibitionist thing, unless you've got some special problem, you know, diet or something, then the use of alcohol in moderation is perfectly accepted. It started by a women's group, It was, yeah. Anyway, sensuality, strife, and jealousy. No need to be jealous of anybody. We all have talents. We all use different talents. Plenty of work for all of us to do. That shouldn't be a problem. But then he, uh, when he says, put on, I, I see you opening your closet in the morning. You know, which dress am I going to wear today? Which suit am I going to wear? Put on your Jesus humility clothes every morning. Isn't that nice? So I've been saying to the students constantly, what talents have you got that God didn't give you? No. Every talent that you have came from God. Our responsibility is to use the talent. Isn't it? They're all different. I love that. I think as you get older, you begin to get that a little bit in perspective. You mellow out. Something like that. You mellow out. Okay. No provision for the flesh. You know what the flesh means. The flesh means the downward pull of human nature. It doesn't mean just flesh. Literally, it means that unconverted part of you which is still potentially there to ruin you. Don't make any provision. Don't play into it. Don't be watching those pornographic movies. My goodness. No, no, no. Turn off that television. The moment it moves in that direction, a fraction, have it right off. Have your spam or whatever it is, the settings in your cell. You can't deal with that. Okay, something like that. 14. Should we, should we move to a little bit more lifestyle stuff here in 14? Who's going to read 14? We got a Matthew, could you read 14? Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Those who have a special day for worshiping the Lord are trying to honor him. Those who eat all kinds of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who won't eat everything also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one <coughs> dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. For this reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he may be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Yeah. That's 10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Yeah, let's take that section here, and a few comments need to be made. Clearly, Paul is dealing with the weak people coming into the church. And Paul is desperately trying to get them to be strong. This is very important. We're looking at the issue of wine and vegetarianism and so on from a different angle. When whole denominations decide forever that it's wrong to eat meat or it's wrong to have a drop of alcohol, this is a totally different situation. He's talking about being tolerant of those coming into the church, but he's very careful to say they're weak. And Paul isn't. So in a very subtle way, be kind to the weak, but try to get them to be strong. Paul is modeling that position. That's quite clear. You can make this text an excuse for not trying to correct anything. But later on, when people come along and say to the whole church, you should be keeping the Sabbath holy days and new moons, or you shouldn't be eating this or drinking that, Paul is right there to condemn the whole lot. You see the point? What you have to realize with Paul is he has a one-track mind. When Paul says something, it's black and white, that's it. There's no exceptions. It's the whole thing right there. That's the way his mind works. And you must then balance one text of Scripture with another. So the important thing to notice here is he's talking about the weak. Those who come in with scruples, they're vegetarians, they're, they've never had a drop of wine in their life, so they're going to be finding some of these new lifestyles difficult. Don't condemn these poor people. Give them a chance. Don't push the wine in front of them so you drink it or else. Don't do that. Tolerate their style, but notice that they are weak. So some people think 
that they can eat everything. Obviously, you don't probably want to eat rats, right? He's talking about all legitimate foods. <laughs> other thing, other people are vegetarians. That's the whole of the Seventh day Adventist movement, all of them, since Ellen G. White. So I said to the lady on the phone the other day, Was Jesus a vegetarian? I said, No. No, he ate fish. We know he ate fish for That struck sure. her as interesting. And he took this Passover, which he had to eat lamb. And then she said, well, Passover, of course, they couldn't have had wine, because wine, you know, it's that filthy, uh, awful <laughs> stuff, because it's contaminated by leaven. See, oh, these are goodness. phony arguments that make us look silly. Let's not look silly. Everybody knows that Enos means wine. Otherwise, Paul would have said, don't get drunk on grape juice, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, these are silly things. These are silly arguments. It's a bit of a Muslim adoption by some Muslims don't and the world mocks us, Carlos. It's an interesting thing. The world looks at us these stupid people. Don't they know that Jesus turned water into wine? Come on. Folks, even the Brit, 98% of whom do not go near the church, they know that Jesus turned water into grape juice. I don't think so. But your Bible clutching person in the Bay of Bible Belt is going to put you in eternal hell. I'm exaggerating. No, you're fine. <laughs> Saying that you, you know, just be normal people. You want to have a champagne at a wedding? Go for it. Don't you dare be drunk. I mean, Jesus, I learned that way back in England. That wasn't the problem. Okay, moving on from that, then he sets himself up as the strong person in regard to days in five. You come in as an inveterate Sabbath keeper, holiday keeper, new moon keeper. You're going, to, you're going to live with that for a while. That's going to seem very hard not to do it. But you have to be convinced gradually. Fully convinced, look aside. Fully convinced in his own mind. Um, then he uses that fully convinced thing later on in verse 14. I know, and I, Paul, am fully convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing, I'm going down with the red, doesn't it, to make the point. That nothing is unclean of itself. It's clear. Is Paul enforcing the Levitical food laws here? If he is, he's in a terrible mind. Isn't he? The poor old Paul is completely incomprehensible, I would say. He's trying to enforce Leviticus 11. I, Paul, he's a Jew. I, Paul, the Jew and Christian, am convinced that nothing is unclean by itself. Oh, boy, of course, you haven't forgotten the food laws. That's just silly. But we, some of us, were dumb enough to accept that for many years. So, worse than that, down in verse 20, you want to link verse 14 with verse 20 of you teaching this all over the place. 14 and 20, in 20, says, Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. Don't make that the biggest. All things are indeed clean. And he's using the word there, katharos, in which we have catharization, catharsis. Can you imagine somebody who's trying to support the Leviticus? Uh, 11 food laws saying, I'm convinced that everything is clean. When a whole bunch of things in, in Leviticus 11 are akarakos, they're unclean. We had our crazy ways of twisting these texts into nothing. I say we. Let's not do that. This is very plain. We don't need to create issues over. Anthony, um, well, we, 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 that scripture oh. we know how, how strong to the point of uh, graphic. Mm -hmm. Paul is regarding the old covenant. Sure. Like he talks about if you're going to get circumcised, just cut your whole private part right. or Very things good. like that. Yeah. Here in this chapter, it's a big, I think this is why it's problematic for a lot of people because Paul here is very live and let live attitude. Very much. So why, why is that? Why is he live and let live attitude yet in in whole letters is very strong against all this yeah. stuff that he's saying, oh, it's just live and let live. You yeah, the answer is very clear. He's dealing, in the immediate context, dealing with weak people coming into the church. When the church is formed and founded, he take, changes his tone entirely when people try to come and force them into Sabbath. Okay, so, so this is context. directed at, at people outside coming in. in. Weak the people in, he's oh. being very, um, how shall I say, strong. tender. It's right, right. very attention to weak people coming in, new converts, don't bash them on the head on these things. But for those who have been, you know, Christians, so to speak, for 2,000 years, it probably is time for us to get like Paul and be strong. But but those coming in, yeah. th those he directs his venom to, mm -hmm. in those other letters, 
Yeah. Aren't, aren't they Christians? Yes, they are, but they're not just weak Christians coming in. They're so an established group. We bear the burden for the weak, right? Yeah. Those of us who are strong enough, and we, we consume the meat of the word, they need milk, they need other words, they need love, and they need tenderness, and, and they will grow. That's right. So if you're looking at a whole established congregation, when people come and try to change all that, then you get changed instead. The other part would be this, is Paul therefore, therefore saying to you that you should all be vegetarians all the time? Listen, you might get offend somebody who isn't a vegetarian. Of course not. If you say you give up all your wine, you might offend somebody who doesn't. You've got somebody coming to dinner with that scruple, you can deal with them appropriately. So this is directed at people weak people who, coming in. Who have the same attitude, like I'm not gonna force it on you, but I still believe this and I'll do it. No. So Paul is sort of soft with those people, but the people who are mature evangelizing a strong well, that, 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 that must be it. That okay. must be it, right? Otherwise let's all be vegetarians forever, lest we might attend. <clears throat> let's all be completely absent from alcohol, we might offend somebody. That's not Paul's position. I, Paul, the Christian and Jew, I'm quite clear that nothing is unclean in itself. So it's not a problem. In Europe, I do think they understand this part of the Bible better than this, a particular hangout in America, with all the brilliant things that Americans do with Bible. This isn't the section we do. We have to think of how each of us was when we left wherever we were in right. previously, most of us anyway. Um, you know, when we first left mm -hmm. the Worldwide Church of God, we still thought we should keep the Sabbath, and we were like, now we know that was wrong, those people, but sure. we thought the Sabbath was between God and us, Absolutely. and how, how, how are we going to keep the Sabbath now, or where, or who with? It, it's a process, and so I think that's what Paul's not talking about the model Christian, he's no. talking about the weak people, the weak people that are that are just learning, that are leaving exactly. other systems, Amen. particularly the Jewish system, because he's yeah. talking so much about yeah. food, because Gentiles didn't sure. matter that much, did they? Anything. But I guess there were some people who felt that it was Christian, or whatever the word, Christian, holy, to, to be vegetarian, oh, yes. I suppose. There was a lot of pagans that had food restrictions. No, you're exactly right. Oh, okay. Your description okay. is perfectly yeah. right. But it's just, this is for this transition time as you're learning, as you're growing and developing. And then we came to a point where one Saturday, we cut the grass. You know, we worked, and that was freaky, but we knew it was right. And it, 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 it is a so, consolation. I mean, he handles that totally different, yes. right? I mean, in exactly. Galatians 4, exactly. verse 9 and 10, he then reminds them. Yes. And he goes to say, but now you have come to know God, or rather to be known of God. Right. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be yeah. enslaved all over you? Next verse, please. Next you verse. observe days and months and seasons and years. Yes. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Isn't that marvelous? I'm terrified about you. You're going back to keeping all of these calendrical things in the Jewish system. I thought I'd taught you better than that. So that's, that's great. That's very great. Our reality is here. Yeah. But it all should be tinged with mercy and love and tolerance, of course, in all cases. Yeah. Okay. Do we want to just comment a couple of things in 14, 1 through 30? We didn't finish reading 14 yet. All right, let's read the rest of 14. I think we can do that. Who's going to read? What, what, tell me what's first 14. 14. This is chapter 14 and 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another for any one, but rather determine this not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in his brother's way. Yes. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Here, 15. And if another Christian is distressed by what you eat, mm -hmm. you are not acting in love if you eat it. Mm -hmm. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who is in this way serves Christ <coughs> is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for building up one another. Right. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. Right. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything 
by which your brother stumbles. Mm -hmm. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because eating is not from the faith, not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Yeah, if your conscience is bothering you, don't have that glass of wine, of course. You know, you could argue that Paul is here saying we should all be vegetarians always, right? You see the logic of that? You might offend somebody out there somewhere. That is to go way outside the context. He's talking about weak people, as he said, coming, transiting from other systems. But if you want to make this the point, you know, the extreme point would be, okay, nobody's ever to touch a glass of wine ever, because you might offend some alcoholic out there. Don't ever do it. Then Jesus was very offensive. You've got to be very careful with the sign. And you know, he didn't, he didn't take names at the wedding no, either. No, he didn't take names no. and say, is anybody here? No. Excuse me. Is anybody going to be offended if I make wine? Because otherwise I won't. If you're going to be offended. Love it. He just made it. What about God when he said in Deuteronomy 14, go to the feast and have your wine, and guess what? You're strong drink. Have it. God didn't say, wait a minute. Everybody at the feast would be all on the same I'm not offending you. God, how are you? Do you have to didn't ask Michelle any AA people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and if there were, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. You know, that's that's where you, this whole thing boils down to judgment. This is all have good judgment of, of as far as offending people, hurting people, uh, making people feel at ease while in your home or sure. wherever. I think that and, the key in this passage also, as Anthony said, is, is fourteen. Yes. I mean, do you want to be Paul? Do you want to be like Paul? Paul makes a very strong, in, 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 in the context of all this live and let live, mm -hmm. he says very strongly, I know and I am convinced of something. Mm -hmm. So do we want to be on, on Paul's I'm trying level to... here? Or... Don't forget he's a Jew. I, the Jew, yes. Christian Paul, am That's convinced the that right. the Leviticus 11 rules are no longer binding. This is a new covenant. But it's a huge struggle out there. People really... The problem is, I think people feel a lack of substance in their faith. So give me something I can really please God with. You know, I'm not going to eat that filthy pork. That's the substance for this. And they cling to that for dear life, rather than getting into the whole framework of the Abrahamic faith, one God, and so on, which should satisfy them. Something like that. They like to view sin as being there in the bottle. Right. Because as long as it's in the bottle, it's not in there. Art. The problem with that is when you go to other countries particularly, and I've told this anecdote before, at least briefly do it, when a group of people who had been told, told that the use of alcohol in any form was taboo, they went over to Israel. And they were there at the Lake of Galilee, and the restaurateur, the owner of the restaurant, said, I'm very sorry, but that wonderful fish that we're preparing for you is going to take another hour to do. So he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to open a bottle of very special Israeli wine and give it to you free. And these dear people put their heads down. <laughs> I'm against it. I'm against that stupidity. If they had not been wrongly taught initially, that would not have arisen. And like their wine, did they, they have to have it? Of course not. They prefer not have it. The rest of the would be the first not to force it on them. But let's be normal citizens. Jesus, you know, mixed with the, right. with the sinners and so on, was acceptable. It was the church that hated him. He was so normal in the right sense. So the church is the danger sometimes, making our standard more righteous than Jesus. Don't try to be more righteous than Jesus. He's a good model. It, it was so odd when we, were, we went to a kaput. Kaputz. 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 And it was so odd because on every table they put a whole bunch of bottles of wine. Yeah. That was free, but the sodas you had to pay for. <laughs> Here, you say, what? Here, you have to pull out an identification your license. <laughs> what? They're like, come right here. Put it in me yourself and grow it there. So, to your Baptist friends, please say, Jesus did an incredible miracle. He turned the 120 gallons of water into alcohol, wine. And the Baptists did an equal miracle. They turned that wine into worship's grape juice. <laughs> now we're smiling at least. Now we can maybe talk to each other, Francis. Okay. Uh, Rick says, Jesus ate and drank with sinners. He came onto their turf to preach the gospel, uh -huh. of course, with moderation. Yes. But yet he was accused of being a wine bibber. Isn't that fun? Isn't that amazing? John the Baptist is accused of being a stupid ascetic. He won't touch the He was under a Nazarite vow. Rightly, that's fine. 
And Jesus then is accused of being white. You can't win, right? Jesus said, if you play them a dirt, they're not going to get sad. And you play them a, a cheerful song, they're not going to smile. And people are like that. They're impossible. I mean, human race, you are impossible in the You are impossible. Get real. Get normal. Well, what was, uh, if you can tell us, uh, so what was the standard under the old covenant of whether something was clean or unclean? What, how was that? Oh, Jesus. Leviticus 11 is the, is the list of foods you, you're not supposed to eat. Right, so how, um, what I'm, uh, I'm not clear on. So they, it had to go through a certain process according to Torah in order to come out clean? No, no, no. Certain, no. Certain, no. Certain, certain animals. Certain animals. Certain animals. Certain animals. Certain animals. Certain animals. Yeah, okay, so yeah. certain animals. Certain animals. Certain animals. Certain animals. Right. You can choose the card. It's a good part of the hook. And buzzards are not to be eaten by a member. <laughs> and then other foods were totally banned. Uh, other uh, animals, I mean, were totally banned. No, the, the criteria is what Sarah just given. Okay. It's a biological criteria. Right. Okay. The rabbis themselves said these are not health laws. Right. There's nothing innately wrong with the fact that eating pork. You could be profitable. They were to teach the people to discern between false and true, clean mm -hmm. and clean. So you can't ha eat an animal that doesn't part the whole right. and chew She's the cow. Is it, was it the same with uh, with vegetables and stuff? Or no, vegetables are okay. No. And then there's the kosher <laughs> madness about how, how to prepare uh, yeah. meat. And yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. That's where that Fanatic yeah. madness, they go and supervise the proceedings. Yeah. Yeah. And just for, for sake of the, yeah. uh, see, uh, some of the folks here are discussing whether uh, whether a lamb is clean or unclean, you know, depending on how it was prepared. I mean, a, a kosher, lamb right. is That's inherently kosher. a kosher, kosher. clean and animal, yeah. and right? Yeah. And it had to be prepared right. correctly, kosher. but. It has to make it kosher. Yeah, yeah that was what I was asking. That's, That's a modern. No, tradition. Tradition. Oh. Preparation of the yeah, food yeah. is a, a, an extra oh, physical thing. Yeah. I mean, you have to have a separate set of dishes yeah. and a separate yeah. set of dishes. Right. Right. Yes. But a lamb in so itself has a list yeah. of clean and unclean yeah. is not yeah. on a list of unclean. No, no, it's not at all. The, yeah. the fish, yeah. the, 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 the soup. Like the Passover. God didn't ask them to eat unclean food at the Passover. Yeah, yeah. So just putting that out here for those who are discussing it because I'm not going to read all the comments. We, we have met people who have a separate dishwasher for kosher yes. and unkosher. Don't put your dishes. Yeah. I mean, this is very burdensome. Mm -hmm. so, okay, so, so that, that was the uh, ladies too. Uh, <laughs> okay, moving on. Yeah, Somebody named Malachi says howdy. Do you all know Malachi? I don't yeah. know Malachi. Where are you from, Malachi? Is that your real name? <laughs> Malachi, identify yourself, please. I mean, you don't have to. I'm teasing, but yeah. come on. <laughs> I don't know, but we have 24 people on mine. One of us. No, 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 Facebook, this is Twitter, a huge and other problem, people. especially especially in the South here. In the no, Bible especially Belt with, with our biblical Unitarian sure. folks who sure. are coming out and the pendulum swinging all the way to those other end of now they're becoming basically messianic. Yes. So don't need to do that. We advertise the faith much better to the world if we are not hung up on these things. It's not you know maybe okay for you to have a hang up about what you eat or drink or wear or don't wear. But what impression are you making on the world that you're trying to convert? That's interesting stuff. And this whole chapter is about the weak and the strong. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what That's I right. think we need to properly convey to people who latch on to certain old covenant things. Of course. And say, look, this, this is about the where do you want to be yeah. uh, in, on the church level, I guess you say. Do you want to be strong or? Yeah, strong. Yeah, verse 1 in chapter 15. Yeah, This goes into that whole subject. Yeah, read that first verse to everybody. Right. Now, now we who are strong yes. ought to bear the weakness of yes. those who are right. without strength or are, are not just be, and not just please ourselves. That's good. Tom, that reminds me of conversations I've had with people whose parents were absolute out and out drunks. 
I remember one gentleman sitting there, and I was talking about you know, the legitimate use of wine is thoroughly biblical. And he, I, he went into almost a rage. He said, don't tell me Jesus would have a glass of beer. And I thought about that. That's very interesting. Well, his father was a drunk who came back and punched his mother day after day. And I, I thought, I get it. I get it. I see. We have to be very tolerant. That's your impression of alcohol. I fully understand you. But don't let your father's drunkenness tell the scripture what to do. Also, I verse, that. verse 4 there, Tom, is... For, ever, for whatever was written in former days yes. was written for our instruction. Isn't that No, so he's talking about something that came before. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, I think we're through. We'll try to do 15 You're with us next Sunday. Appreciate all your comments. Next Sunday, oh, the conference? No, that's right. We'll be hearing from Ken Ross yes. preaching at Simpsonwood. Methodist Retreat Center next Sunday, and then we'll be back to normal procedure the following Sunday. God willing. Finish with this rising song, 351, uh, with a story to tell. Can I tell read a couple of comments? Another excellent lesson. Yes. Malachi is a Canadian. Just a Canadian. Canadian. Wow. Well, I don't want to kill brain cells with Trinitarianism. <laughs> Not sure what that means. Uh, like Paul was all things to all people, the week he appeared as we to the week yes, he appeared as that's we. That's right. All things to all, all men. One. Some people do not drink any alcohol, but then drink two gallons of coffee and three liters of soda a day. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> not a good thing. And moderation <laughs> is the key. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. I'm thrilled that we have a measure of great unity here. Wow. A story of peace and love, a story of peace and love, for the darkness turned to dawn, and the darkness to the 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 we the soul to be sung to the nation, and shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall come to the people, and shall be the sea of the soul. And shall be the sea of the soul. The darkness shall turn to morning, and the Lord into the
but then we in love should try to strengthen one another, not tear down. So, Father, we ask that you will go with us as we go out. Show us the way to treat one another in faith and always be with us until we come back again so we can join again as a, as a fellowship and praise in you. So we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.